You're listening to Tarazi Tuesdays with the Bible as Literature. Hi, this is Father Mark Bulos, and you are listening to Tarazi Tuesdays with the Bible as Literature podcast. In today's program, Father Paul explains the importance of not only hearing, but seeing consonantal Hebrew roots and their interconnection in the original text. I am happy to introduce Father Paul on the Bible as Literature podcast, Tarazi Tuesdays. Okay. I jump to Elohim because this is the calamity of all theology, already the word theology is linked to theos, God. But let me go back to Reshit and then obviously Bara. These three words are very powerful and those who heard me before notice the original Hebrew is very powerful, mm-hmm. not so much to the ear as to the eye. Remember, the eye is very important because I stress it that you have to see the original consonants. Okay? When you hear it, even in Hebrew now, Bereshit, Bara, you hear the same sound as Bara, but what is more impressive is that in Hebrew, The re, the sound re, is followed by an aleph, and bara, the second sound a, is followed by an aleph, which you can't hear, but you can see in the text. So, the first three letters of the combined word, which is a preposition and a noun, bereshit, are the three letters that form bara. With all due respect, friends, that cannot be happenstance. Very interesting. Let's see what we can do with that. Reshit. Okay, write it down, my hearers. R-E apostrophe, which is the international rendering of the Semitic Aleph in international transliteration, which is a letter. And then SH is one letter, the SH, and then EAT. So you have the three letters, and we'll come back to that. RESH, which is the R, the Aleph, which is the E, and the SHEEN, which is the SH. But this is how you have to see it in front of you. Write it down. R is a consonant. E is a vowel added. The apostrophe is the international rendering of the Aleph in Hebrew, the sound E. SH, technically, in my book, you notice that I write it S with a V on top of it, which is the international rendering of the SH, to remind you that it's one letter, not two letters. Okay? And the ending, the sound, it. The first word in scripture, which is Bereshit, rendered as in the beginning. Remember, in Hebrew, most of the prepositions are one consonant which is linked to the following word. Like the and in all Semitic languages. The and is a w which is just before the word. You don't write it by itself. So the first total word in scripture rendered as in the beginning is perhaps the most classical example concerning the necessity of not only hearing the original, but also of viewing it mentally. That is to say, seeing the consonants. And all the hearers 
that happen to be taking my Hebrew will understand what I'm saying because I'm forcing them to hear the text with their eyes so that they can analyze the text on the basis of consonants and not also on vocalic sounds added not before the 7th century. And they are getting the point. Don't believe them that they tell you that they are working hard. I am working them hard to get to that point. And you will see soon the importance of these statements of mine. In the beginning of my presentation, pun intended, by the way. <laughs> ah, that's not bad, the intended. In the beginning of my presentation regarding Genesis 1 through 11, pun intended, I asked you to hear with me. Now I'm asking my hearers to bear, B-A-R-E, that is, unplug their ears and use them to hear me out so that my words reach their honest mind rather than using their platonically formatted mind to assess what I'm saying against it. You hearers have to assess for yourselves, not by quoting another father of the church or your parish priest against me when neither of those knows Hebrew. But you still have to assess you have a responsibility. That's why I want you to take notes. You can, the first time, begin to listen to podcasts when you are in the car, but when you come back home, listen to it and take notes. Without going into too much detail regarding an exclusively consonantal alphabet, as I repeatedly say, you don't have vowels in the Semitic alphabets. And one considering both vowels and consonants equally as alphabetical letters, which is the Greek, the Latin, and the English. So let me not go down that road. Let me point out that both the Greek and the Latin alphabets are patterned sequence-wise after the Semitic one, which thus not only precedes the other two, but constituted their basis. Suffice it to mention two examples pertaining to the Latin alphabet that is the basis for our English alphabet. I mentioned this before, but let's revisit it. One, the sequences a, B, C, D, K, L, M, N, Q, R, S, T are common to both Greek and Latin and follow the Semitic order. However, the Latin Q is missing from the Greek. So you could see there is something strange about this K and Q. The strange thing about Q is that sound-wise it doubles up with that of K in the European languages. In the Semitic languages they reflect two totally different sounds. Okay? You want to hear it? The K is a K and the Q is a K. There's a difference between the two. Kala in Arabic means he said. Kala means he measured. Now, for heaven's sakes. Okay? That's why when you want to write Quran, stop writing it with a K, as many people still do in the Western world. Out of respect for Islam, write it with a Q. And put the apostrophe after it. Quran. Q U R apostrophe A N, the apostrophe reflecting the sound E, Aleph. Okay, out of respect. The precision regarding sounds in Semitic languages can be seen in that their alphabet 
does not have the, in their view, illogical existence of so-called diphthongs that combine two sounds already present in their alphabets. Take the xi and the psi in Greek, which is silly. Why would you have a letter which is xi when you have the letter k, kappa, and sigma? Now, I don't need my Greek here to try to answer me. It's a rhetorical question. Okay? And the other one is the famous psi in Greek. And the x in Latin corresponding to the Greek xi. Correct? I mean, you have this X, which is strange in our languages. The Semitic languages, you don't have diphthongs. And each letter has its sound. Number two, the other more important feature of both the Greek and Latin, and consequently all European alphabets, is that the first letter, A, is actually the rendering of the Semitic consonant Aleph, whose sound is produced without the movement of the vocal cords. That's why it's just a sound, U. Uh. If you have the sound U after it, like the vowel U, you say U. If you have O, it becomes O. A, it becomes A. That's very important to remember. And it's a pain every time you have to render the Hebrew in European languages, this Aleph. And this is what precisely we have in Reshit. Now, hopefully you understand the reason why I'm going to this supposedly non-necessary aside. It is necessary. My hearers will soon appreciate this seemingly strange, if not unnecessary, aside in relation to the noun reshit that is rendered as beginning. You have four letters, the R, the Aleph, apostrophe, the Sh, S, with a V above it, and the T. So technically, you have four consonants, which is from the root Rosh, which is resh, the r, apostrophe, which is the alif, and the sh. Very important. But unless someone knows Hebrew, one will never be able to relate that noun with the following six instances, except for Genesis 10.10, where we have the exact same noun reshit rendered as beginning. Okay? I'm going to read you these passages and you will understand the importance of this root. RSV, and then I'll do the original Hebrew. In 210, a river flowed out of Eden to water the garden, and there it divided and became four rivers. Now, if you read the KJV, or even the Arabic, you have heads. Why? Because the original is Roshim, heads, the plural. Remember, im is the plural of Rosh. That's what I have in the original. Why? We'll have to figure out. But if you're hearing the RSV, oh, one river became four rivers. Genesis 3.15 I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. She shall bruise your head. Rosh. One more time. R apostrophe and sh. Three letters. And you shall bruise his heel. Genesis 3.15 Let's go to 8.5 And the waters continued to abate until the tenth month. In the tenth month, on the first day of the month, the tops of the mountains were seen. Tops in Hebrew is Rashi, which is a truncated form of Rashim, which means the heads of the mountains were seen. In 813, 
in the sixth hundred and first year, in the first month, in Hebrew, just Ba Rishon, in the first. The first day of the month, the waters were dried. So the first month, the first day, waters were dried from the earth, and Noah removed the covering of the ark and looked, and behold, the face of the ground was dry. In 1010, the beginning of his kingdom was Babel, about Nimrod. Beginning is Reshit, the exact same word as in Genesis 1-1. was Babel, Eric, and Akkad, all of them in the land of Shinar. And finally, in Genesis 11-4, then they said, come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower with its top, you have guessed, Rosh, head in the heavens, and let us make a name for ourselves, lest we be scattered abroad upon the face of the earth. Now, one can say, you know, well, the meaning is very clear. What's the big deal of the original? But that's the problem. <laughs> if in the original they are connected, then every time you're hearing it, there is a connection. Remember the play on Zara, Zera, and so on. Now, is the connection of the essence or imp I don't know yet. But an English hearer is going to gloss even about the issue of the possible serious connection between the two. In other words, a hearer in the translation more often than not misses the issue. That's all I'm saying. Hmm. To realize that there is an issue does not mean that you have solved it. I spend a good number of hours in my presentation telling you that you have to be patient and figure out. But here we go. We have a long series of this root. One more time, an R, an E, and then a SH. It is impossible for someone who knows Biblical Hebrew or even any Semitic language not to hear or more appropriately see the consonantal identical roots of all the above Reshit, Rashim, Rosh, Rishon, which is Resh, R, Aleph, Shin. In Arabic, it is at its clearest because one hears in all cases the Semitic Aleph. In Arabic, we say Ra's. In spoken Arabic, it sounds like the Hebrew, Ras. But in the literary Arabic, let's say, when you're preaching in the church, when you're speaking officially, you have to say, Ras. Ras. I told you earlier that the S and the Sheen are two connected letters. In spoken Arabic, it is Ras, but the hearers supply the E uh, because they know Arabic. Like if I'm speaking and I say Ras, and you're taking notes, you have to write it with an Aleph. You cannot write it as R-S. Okay, I hope I was clear enough. And here I have the example of one of my students in Hebrew who is the Coptic priest of one of the Coptic churches here. He's Egyptian and obviously he knows Arabic. And then every time I'm explaining something in Hebrew, I tell the other students, look at Father Jacob. Is he smiling or not? If he's smiling, then I'm talking sense. <laughs> you don't have to figure things out. It helps him. But it is dangerous because you have to submit to the Hebrew. Now, the reaction of most of my hearers well, this is too much complicated. We don't have this in our pure English. We don't have this in our superlative Francais, French. Well, <sighs> the French-speaking people immediately detect from the context, I'm going to burst your bubbles. That is the functionality of the word in a sentence. 
if the sound V is to be perceived as V-I-N meaning wine or V-A-I-N meaning vein or V-I-N-G-T meaning 20. Technical knockout, Father Paul. Or we haven't finished. Or the simple past tense V-I-N-S that applies to all three persons I, you, he, she in the singular. There you go. So it's not a unique instance. And the people are expecting for me to slam Anglo-Saxonism. And it's coming. The English-speaking people should not gloat, given the following, just to name a few. I'll, A-I-S-L-E, I apostrophe L-L, and I-S-L-E. Write them down, hearers. By, B-U-Y, B-Y, and B-Y-E. Censor, C-E-N-S-E-R, whether you know what it means or not, doesn't matter. It's this machinery the Orthodox priests do to sense. Censor, C-E-N-S-O-R, and censor, this is the electronics of Father Mark, S-E-N-S-O-R. I have two more examples, English-speaking people. Stop gloating. Now I'm gloating. Sent, C-E-N-T, S-C-E-N-T, and S-E-N-T. Sight, C-I-T-E, S-I-G-H-T, and S-I-T-E. There we go. So please, I beg you, and I hope you'll take seriously this, that you, as an English speaking, have no problem. But how do you figure this out when I'm speaking quickly? From the context. Coming back to Rosh in scripture, it is impossible for my English speaking listeners to hear the exact original, let alone the possible intended linkage between beginning, rivers, head, top, and first. These are five different words in English. So watch out, you hearers. Don't go around asking other hearers and start a discussion about what I said. You're losing your precious time. Write down my notes and go back and check your scripture. So please, I beg you once more to take notes and study them later and stop the lame excuse I heard zillion times over the years. Father Paul is imposing on us his own understanding and does not allow us to express our opinion. What I like about this statement is that it speaks of my understanding versus the other's opinion. Thank you very much. At any rate, take notes and then decide for yourself. At any rate, you are going to do what you already said to do. But you'd better watch out. It's the Lord who is coming to judge us all. And beware, he may well say to you, but my open books tell me that you listen to Father Paul's podcast in which he asks you to take notes and study them at all. However, in these same open books, I find no notation you did so. Let me repeat this to my hearers. The Lord is coming to judge us all and beware he may well say to you but my open books tell me that you listen to Father Paul's podcast in which he asks you to take notes study them at home however in these same open books of mine I find no notation you did so and do not hide behind the Greco-Roman fathers of the church who did not know biblical Hebrew the couple who did use Hebrew here and there however Consistently, they were exegeting the Septuagint and the Vulgate. As for the Jews, take seriously Mitchell Dahoud's negative assessment, not only of the Vulgate and the Septuagint, but also of the Masoretic text 
the vocalized text that is the product of the 7th to the 10th century AD. Again, take notes. The Bible as Literature is a production of the Ephesus School Network.